Hallelujah. This is the night the Lord has made. Amen. Are you going to be miserable or rejoice? Well, praise God. <laughs> Glory. Oh, yes. Nothing like getting refreshed, refilled, and reset in the presence of God. You know, when you touch him, he touches you. Does everybody get it? You touch his heart, he touches yours. That's why some people don't get touched because they don't touch him. The woman with the issue of blood didn't get, did not get touched until she touched him. Amen? And then she got healed. See, the problem is that so many times people get caught up in their own emotional, selfish, what I've done, what I haven't done. They're so carnally allowing intellectual carnality to dictate everything, how God should be and what he should do and when he should do it. And just cut your head off, stick a rag in its mouth, and let God be God. And go after the presence of God. Amen? See, because what he wants you to do is exchange your presence for his. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, without God's presence, we're nothing. Especially what's coming. People are going to miss a lot of things that are happening. Because they lack the presence of God. You know, if you didn't, if you weren't here let's say, Sunday, I encourage you to get to teaching. It's called Divine Intelligence. It will blow you away. Many people missed it. But anyways, praise be to God. So we're going to go to another level called Divine Reality. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Oh, yes. Divine reality. Anybody ever come up to you and say, man, get real. <laughs> In other words, they're trying to say, get a life, something to that degree, or you're so messed up, you need to get real. <laughs> get real. That means... It's another word for saying, you're an idiot. <laughs> get real. That was a polite way. God is saying get real, but it's not the area of real. There are multiple realities. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 7, would you read it with me? But we have this what? Treasure. How, anybody know what a treasure is? It's something vitally valuable. It's a treasure. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Are you an earthen vessel? Yeah. That the excellence of the power of God m may be of God and not what? Us. We are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Because you got to die to rise. That's why the Lord says he delights in the death of his saints. He's saying deny yourself. That's what, I mean, and again, that goes back to the formula. Deny yourself, pick up the cross, fight, and then you can follow. That's why people can't follow. Because they haven't mastered the first part. And you and I must master death. Does everybody get that? We must come to a place where we master it. We don't play with it. We master it. We know we must deny ourselves. That should be ultimate every time. You and I must master it as Christians, just like Jesus mastered it, to deny himself. All glory. Verse 11. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, 
that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but what? Life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the grace plan of escape, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we don't what? We don't lose heart. How can you prevent from losing heart? You constantly abide. You fight for the exchange of your presence for God's presence. It's a constant. In other words, again, if you've come to the place where you are mastering your death, you will never lack. You will never sorrow. You won't be moved because you can't move a dead man. Amen? You can't cause a dead man to react because you have mastered your death in Christ. See, when you are dead, you are hidden in Christ. Oh, if people can grab hold of these things. Mastering your death. That means you are fully looking. You actually look for places to deny yourself. See, you're not waiting for it. Everything that's in your life, you're looking. You've already, you're getting ready to deny yourself in it. Everywhere you go, everything you do, every decision you're getting ready, you are looking to already deny yourself. You are mastering your death. And by mastering your death, Christ has reign. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our what? Outward man is perishing. Hallelujah. Yet the inward man is being what? Renewed. Day by day. It's being renewed. It's being refreshed. It's being reset. Is being restored. Where? Into Christ's image. Will that continue to happen if you will not deny yourself? No. No. That's why by mastering your death, Christ is always has dominion. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which some people <coughs> don't think it's so light, which is but for a what? Moment, but many people think it's forever. Is working for who? It's working for us. Now, the Lord says that many are afflictions that are righteous, but he delivers them out of all of them. So your afflictions, your trials, your tribulations, your challenges, your failures, all of these things, your disappointments, your we're all of these things, your sicknesses, all, everything is working for your benefit. Well, how can it work for my benefit? It's causing you to master your death. Now, I want you to know I had no intentions of speaking on this arena. So I want you to know this is fresh rhema from the throne of God. Is everybody okay? For our light affliction, which is a but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and, and Eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are what? Not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporary, but the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. So this treasure in earth and vessel is the presence of eternity. Whoa. It's the presence of what? Eternity in you and I. It is called divine our afflictions are awakenings that lead us into another reality. Our afflictions are awakenings that lead us into another reality. Where you and I call out to God. <laughs> Who is from another reality. 
So you and I are calling out to God from the temporary reality to the eternal reality in hope of a, of divine, of a divine intervention. I'm going to say this again. For our light afflictions are awakenings that lead us into another reality where you and I call out to God from a temporary reality to the eternal reality. Is everybody with me? In this, there is hope of a divine intervention. And when this divine intervention comes, why? Because what does it do? When a divine intervention comes, it releases an understanding of a divine reality. So in this, you and I are looking for a divine intervention that will manifest. Did you ever get a prayer answered? Does it bring you a reality? Yes. Yeah. See, it brings you a reality from the eternal reality into the temporary reality. So it connects you. See, God is always trying to make himself real to me and you. That's called divine reality. He's always trying to make himself real. That's, especially when you're young in Christ, Man, hang around with those that are young in Christ. They got realities going all the time, man. Because once you've reached that place where you are now living in the true reality or in the eternal reality and you are connecting with it all the time, it's constant. You and I live it. That's the way you live. Does everybody understand this? this that's how you live. You can't live without it. Praise God. Divine reality. What is it? <laughs> what is this earth and vessels that have this treasure? It's called eternal presence. Again, you and I are, our afflictions are awakenings that lead us into another reality, calling out to God from the temporary reality to the eternal reality in hope of a divine intervention that will manifest and what's it doing? It's releasing to you and me an understanding of the divine reality, the eternal place. Wow. It, it opens eyes. It opens ears. It illuminates. It says, yes, he's real. He's my father and I'm his child. And it makes it constant. That's why you and I yearn for it all the time. We live for it. We fight for it. But unless you've never tasted it, did you ever go somewhere and eat a good cookie? Good piece of cake, man? It's like, whoa. You, you only had, a, and there was only a few little bites left. And you ate those couple bites and you said, gosh, I could eat a big one. And you desired it. It's like, whoa. Once you've tasted it, it was like, yo. You ran out. Aren't you going to make any more? Not till I'm out. And you go home and you get up the next day and you find the phone number of that place. Now you're seeking because there was something that you tasted that was so good. See, when you taste God's presence, it's great. Now don't start thinking about cookies and all this stuff, all right? <laughs> Start thinking, come on, get out of the temporary reality into the eternal reality. <laughs> That's why the Lord says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Once you've tasted the presence of God, you don't want anything else. Food is just food. It's fuel for the flesh. Acts 1. <laughs> Gosh. People were starting to get deep into that one, man. I was like, whoa, we better pull out of this. <laughs> we want to go home and make popcorn right away or something. <laughs> Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Divine reality. 
you know, that's something that you and I are always, since we've come into this realm, we're always wanting to know what's real. You know? And, and so we see truth and hope that it's real. <laughs> you know? But we've been lied to so many times by the ruler of this world who's the father of lies. So we're thinking all of these things that are true, and truth is supposed to bring reality. Um, but if it's temporary truth, it doesn't bring eternal reality, which is divine reality. Only divine truth brings divine reality. Uh, so in this place where it's always waiting for me and you, Again, when you start mastering your death, it begins to come off the shelf. It begins to come. Because no part of you can enter that place. No part of the old man can enter that place. It's always, in other words, Jesus always is looking for Jesus. The Father looks for Jesus. So he looks for the presence of his Son. That's why you and I are called sons and daughters of the offspring of the Most High. He's not looking for the carnal person or the old person. He's looking for the new person with the character of his son. So Daddy's looking for his son, his daughters, that carry the character of Christ. But that cannot come forth until there's an area you and I are constantly mastering our death. That's what Jesus was. He didn't come to live. He came to die. He was mastering his death all the way to the cross. In fact, he physically died on the cross, but he truly died in the Garden of Gethsemane. He died to himself when the enemy was tempting him constantly. He fought so hard that his body could not even handle the presence of that earthen vessel that carried that treasure of the power of God, that eternal presence that was burning through, knowing that he had to taste death for all mankind so that mankind could now taste life, his presence. So he died in Gethsemane, but he fulfilled it on the cross. Why? Because he mastered death. And by mastering death, he brought life. Acts 1.1 1, 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. This is Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And he's writing to a friend of his who was an attorney or a doctor or something. I forgot what it was. I think he was an attorney. In verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. He gave what? Commandments. So these are commandments. In other words, commandments are commands from God by, delivered by the Holy Spirit. It's no longer the area where it's the Ten Commandments. It's a constant commandment. Or you're listening to his voice and he's saying, do this, do this, do this. Those are commandments. In verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, in other words, after his crucifixion and resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus hung out for 40 more days. And being assembled together with them, he did what? He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. There was a reason why he commanded them to do that. Now, I want you to understand that he commanded 500 disciples. But only 180 showed up. Somebody got that. That's a lot. That didn't show up, isn't it? In verse 4, and being as, I mean, uh, in verse 6, therefore when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, 
will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? But he wasn't speaking about the kingdom of Israel. He was talking about the kingdom of God. And Jesus answered them and said, it is not for you to know times or what? Seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive what? Power. To do what? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So what was the baptism of the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit supposed to do? It was supposed to bring divine reality. Does everybody get it? The, who is the Holy Spirit? He is the one that brings divine reality to me and you. That's why it's important to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit now. Why? Because he's the carrier of the anointing, the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. He's the one that brings revelation. He's the one that brings illumination. He brings all truth. Now, this is divine truth. And where there's divine truth, there's divine reality. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Oh, happy day. Divine reality. So one of the things the enemy tries to do is bring false reality, doesn't he? Even though you believe that it's real. Did you ever believe something was real and you found out later it wasn't? I mean, you would have bet your life on it. Thank God you got rescued from it. Because many of us bet our lives on a lot of stuff that was wrong. Amen? Because we were so convinced. <laughs> yes. Acts, I mean, uh, Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Is everybody there? And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my what? My spirit. And what's the Holy Spirit bring? Divine reality. And I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Man, I can't wait for all of that to happen. And your sons and your daughters will what? Prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Thank God I see visions. And also on my men servants... And on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now we know God has been pouring out his spirit since the day of Pentecost was fulfilled. Amen? Now he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Now if he poured it on all flesh, he's drawn mankind onto him, but not everyone is accepting it, right? So there's an area where there's acceptance, and then he pours out his spirit to those who are able to receive it. Now he says, and we're going to have dreams, and we're going to have visions, and we're going to prophesy. They're going to have dreams. They're going to have visions. They're going to prophesy. Why? Because these are the gifts of the Spirit. And what's, what do they do? They bring divine revelation. How many of y'all know dreams will bring divine revelation when God speaks to you in it? How many times did you hear about somebody warned in, the, in a dream? Look at Moses. Noah. Moses. I, I mean, all of these men and women of God have been one. Joseph. Or warned in a dream because the enemy was trying to kill them. See, when God begins to reveal things to you in this arena where there's revelations, divine revelations, it becomes symbolic in the area where God begins to speak. You'll learn symbols that he speaks to you. You'll learn certain things that come that you know. Some of them are warnings. It could be and, and, and they'll reoccur in certain areas. God begins to expose things. And as you, begins, as you begin to see these things and understand these things, more of a divine reality comes to you. It's like, whoa, it's real. Because that's one of the greatest desires for God is for you to see what he sees and so that the reality of eternity is more real to you than this realm. Even though this reality is temporary. In other words, if you really know that this realm is temporary, 
you're not going to put all your eggs in this basket. Amen? You're going to start putting your eggs in the eternal basket. That's where he says building treasures in heaven because that is real to you. <laughs> you know that everything's temporary. Now, and you know that no matter what's going on in your life because you're, even though you're in this temporary reality, but you're living from the eternal reality, the divine reality, you know that everything's going to work to the good no matter what's going on. No matter what's happening. So that's why you don't worry. You don't fear. You don't get involved in frustration. You don't get involved in carnality, entanglements and affairs of the world. Why? Because everything's going to work to the good. Because you are now living from the future to the present. Because you're living from the divine reality. It is so real to you now. That no matter what someone says, no matter what's going on in your life, they can't convince you any other way because you know that you know that you know and you know is everybody okay all right verse 30 and i will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood is the moon turned into blood at all oh yeah we've had the tetra and before the coming of the great and awesome day of the lord and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant who the Lord calls. Again, dreams, vision, gifts of the Spirit. That's why praying in tongues brings divine revelations, confirmations, manifestations, realizations of what? Divine reality. Again, it's not celestial, terrestrial, but divine. Amen? From the eternal realm and the creator of true reality. We talk again about being in the matrix here, right? Which is temporary reality. And it's controlled by false realities. This realm was controlled by false realities. That's why false realities is called deception. That's all he can produce is a false reality. He cannot tell the truth. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 22. When God speaks to Israel in certain terms, he also speaks to the body. And he says, therefore, say, he's speaking to Ezekiel. He says, prophesy and speak this to the people of Israel. It says, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am what? Hallowed in you before their eyes. In other words, when he is honored, respected, feared in you, reverenced, when he is in you. That's why he says we are the earthen treasures, the earthen vessels that carry that treasure. That treasure is called the eternal presence. In verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of the countries. He's going to explain how he's going to become hallowed in you. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a what? A new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. It's called born again. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And then what will he do? He will put his spirit, the eternal presence, within you, and he's going to cause you. Say cause. What's he going to do? He's going to cause a divine reality to come to you. And I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes because without a divine reality, there is no desire to want to please God. 
and you will keep my judgment and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Then what? I will deliver from all your uncleanness. I'll call for the grain and multiply it and I'll bring no famine upon you. How many of y'all know a famine's coming? Amen. We are in the time of plenty, but there will be a famine. And I'll multiply the fruit of your trees and increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. That's called prosperity. So he's going to cause a divine reality. Why? By the eternal presence that's in you. In John 14. In verse 15. When the divine reality comes, you don't want to do anything that interrupts it. You don't want to do nothing that would cause any contamination to that presence that is bringing reality, that divine reality. See, the enemy always tries to bring fear. He's always trying to contaminate something. He's trying to get us into a place of compromise or complacency or laziness or ju false justification or reasoning so that we open a door to the enemy, and he has access to contaminate. And, and then what happens is we have to fight again and battle to get back to that divine reality. And sometimes that fight takes even harder. That's why the word says when a person gets cleaned up and blows it again, uh, their first state is worse. <laughs> <laughs> their present state is worse than their first state because it becomes harder to battle. See, you may get to a point where you know it, but you can't do it because of the lack of the presence and power of God. So we may know it carnal, we may know it intellectually, but we don't have the power to do it because it's been contaminated. Now we lean more on intellectual instead of God's presence and power. Well, I know that. Well, then why aren't you doing it? Well, I don't. Contamination. Hallelujah. Verse 15. 14, 15. He says what? If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you where? Forever. He is called the what? Spirit of truth. Now, the spirit, true reality, hello, brings divine reality. Whom the world cannot receive. So the world can't receive the truth of the Holy Spirit. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. Wow. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. He who is, he who is my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will what? Manifest myself to him. I will do what? Manifest. Now how does he manifest? Through illumination, revelations. Through his spirit. He will manifest. Manifest what? Answered prayer. Manifest a touch. Manifest a dream. Manifest a vision. Why? Because what's he going to bring you? Divine reality. Oh, glory. Manifest. Bring divine reality. Where there is 
divine reality, illumination, witness of divine, there's divine, uh, I mean, where there's divine revelation, there's divine reality. When divine reality is constant to you, one of the things that also is constant is identity. When people lose divine reality, they also lose identity. In Acts chapter 9. I think the testimony of Saul who became Paul was just phenomenal to me. In the area of a talk about a divine reality. Snap. And Saul's still breathing threats and murder, murder, murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest. Now, Paul was a Pharisee. And he was a part of the Sanhedrin group, the religious sect. They abided by the law. They believed that Jesus was a cult and that he didn't abide according, Jesus did not abide according to the rules and regulations that were associated with the religious sect. In fact, he healed on the Sabbath and it was a real no-no. And uh, he cast out devils on the Sabbath and it was a real no-no to them. He didn't understand that he was the Lord of the Sabbath and he could do whatever he wants. <laughs> See, they couldn't grab hold of that because they were too stuck up in religion with intellectual minds and no reality. That's when Jesus said, man, you search the scriptures <laughs> thinking you're saved and you don't even know me. Don't even know me because he, he desires a reality relationship, a true reality relationship. So Saul got letters from Damascus from the synagogues that he might find anyone who were of the way who were followers of Jesus, whether men, women, or children, and bring them back so they can be killed and murdered. And he journeyed, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Well, obviously, he acknowledged another reality here. He just called something that slammed him off his horse, blinded him with a light. <laughs> he knew there was a, some kind of divine intervention here, <laughs> something he didn't understand yet, but he called Lord because he had control over him. Paul had no control. And he said, uh, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. You talk about uh, guilt, condemnation, shame, and how stupid can I be and still breathe? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so he trembling, you bet he was trembling. He didn't know if God was going to cook him right there. Really analyzing how many people he murdered and how many families he destroyed and how many children were killed because of what his belief system was, what his reality was, even though it was false and a lie. He realized that he'd been lied to, living in a life of deception, thinking he was doing the right thing, betting his life on it, that he was serving God. Come to find out, he was serving the wrong God. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do? You bet he's going to say, what do you want me to do? Because he knew if he said the wrong thing, he could poof. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. I don't think he asked another question. Then the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Ah, he could no longer lead himself. Do you see what happened? He could no longer lead himself. He needed to be led. It's called from pride to humble. Yeah. Now, they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus in verse 9, and he was there three days without sight, 
and neither ate nor drank. God put him on a fast. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision. Whoa, Ananias. Vision. So in, Ananias obviously had visions and dreams. So divine reality was truth to him. Amen. So the Lord appears to him in a, in a vision. And he says to him, he called out Ananias, and Ananias answered and said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of a house of Judas, for I called Saul of Tarsus, one called Saul of Tarsus. And behold, he is praying. He's praying for his life. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in. Now, Paul's got a vision also. Remember, he was blinded. He still can't see. People got to, he can't eat. He's not, you know. He's praying, God help. What just happened? He's trying to get understanding of everything. But while he can't see physically, he can see spiritually. And he has a vision about a man named Ananias coming in. And he says here, and, it, and in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might, what? Receive his sight. What was he going to do? He was going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then I, Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name, Lord. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must what? Suffer for my name's sake. Now, why was he going to suffer? Because these are going to keep him in a divine reality. Does everybody get it? And I, Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your spiritual sight and physical sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you may walk in a divine reality. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some time, some days with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he what? Preached the Christ. He had reality of the Christ. The eternal presence and power of God Almighty. The true reality that was a divine reality that he was now living in. And immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Wow. <laughs> divine revelation, divine revelation, divine reality. See, this is where he became witness. He was able to witness. Why? Because the witness that was within him. Remember, Jesus said, I am the witness. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So this happened to Saul, became Paul. And he wrote most of the New Testament by revelation of In verse 1, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and what? Revelations. Why would he come to visions and revelations? Because he's living from the future, not from the past. He's now living in the divine reality. That reality to him is stronger than the temporary reality. He says, I know a man of Christ who 14 years ago... Whether in the body I do not know, nor or out of the body I do not know. God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I now I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Powerful. So he was caught up into the what? Third heaven. Of such one I will boast, yet... Of myself, I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, 
for I will speak the truth. He did not want to boast. Why? Because it would contaminate. Did everybody get this? He was, he was concerned of pride. He didn't want to contaminate anything. He didn't want to justify. He didn't want to affect that divine reality and walking in that divine reality. He didn't want to make no place for the devil because he knew that the devil would try to bring him a false reality again. He stayed away. He said, man, I don't want to lose this. I want to learn more. I want more. I want to learn the sufferings of Christ. Why? Because more revelations would come would, would bring him deeper into divine reality. He was losing himself more and more every single day. He was disappearing from the temporary reality and departing more and more into the divine reality every day, more and more. That's why his speech was hard to understand, it says. Some of his writings were hard to understand for people because he was speaking from the divine reality into a temporary reality. Oh, glory. <laughs> Is everybody getting this? Oh, cool. Divine reality by revelations, Roman 8. Verse 18. <laughs> yeah. Let's speak it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, which time is that temporary reality, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. From where? The divine reality. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility not willingly be because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but... But we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and redemption of our body. We're waiting to shed this flesh. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with what? perseverance or endurance. Oh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5. In verse 1. Divine reality. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the what? Heavenlies. Wow, that's called divine reality right there. See, but without divine reality, this is... Uh, this is not a reality, it's a hope. It's got to be divine revelation. Without divine revelation, there is no divine reality. So people fall into a hope instead of a reality. See, when, it, when, it's, a tr when it's a reality, it's a truth. So in other words, we're not going to say, okay, uh, man, I hope that there's a building waiting for me. Gosh, I hope that there's a glorified body waiting. No, there's a no, I know. I know. I can't wait to shed this stuff, man. I can't wait to get my glorified body. I'm excited about it. Hallelujah. So it's a knowing. 
There's no assumption. There's no false hope. There's no maybes. It is. <laughs> Glory. And that's where we want to get to. It's got to be a, it is. All right, let's go a little further. Uh, where are we anyway? Oh. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavenlies. For in this we do what? We groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our what? Habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but what? Further close that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the who? The Spirit who brings what? Divine reality. He's given us the Spirit as a what? Guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that what? We are at home in the body. We are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim whether present or absent to be what? Well pleasing to God. Why? Because we're all going to appear, appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to, to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. <laughs> Anybody know some of those? Don't raise your hand. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge us that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but they should what? Master their death. But for him who died for them and rose again. Powerful. Therefore, from now on, we don't recognize according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, and behold, all things have become new. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 1. As we have received mercy, we don't lose heart again. But even if our gospel is veiled as those who are, it's veiled to those who are what? They're perishing. Why? Because the God of this age has prevented them from receiving revelation, knowledge, and divine reality. Whose minds the God of this age have blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Vitally important. They are blinded without the gospel. Why? Because the gospel brings, by the Spirit of God, this gospel brings seed. It's anointed seed that imparts. And when that seed is imparted, when it's mixed with the Holy Spirit who waters, it brings birth. And when it brings birth, it brings birth to illumination revelation. And when that illumination and revelation comes, it brings a true reality and a divine reality that God is with you. His promises are true and amen. 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. There's a lot to have a good talk, but no walk. Amen? And you can talk it, bro, but you sure can't walk it. Lack of divine revelation. 
and divine reality. Again, God wants you to know that he is real. His promises are real. Eternity is real. His presence is real. His love is real. And this life is real. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is... Is everybody there with me? Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot also, who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments aren't burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, which is your connection with him. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who does what? bears witness because the spirit is what truth so what's he bearing witness he's bearing witness of the divine reality he's bearing witness of the truth so that you and i can walk in a reality all the time that there's a divine reality and a temporary reality so that you and i can look around all the time and just go man this is just temporary but there's another reality that I'm connected to. I'm connected to. It's not that I'm just waiting. I'm already connected to it. So if you're connected to it, you're already walking in it. Oh, glory. Now watch this. Are you ready? Verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. Where? In heaven. And where is heaven? Divine reality. Does everybody get it? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. There's three of them. And these are what? One. They bear witness. The Father, the what? The Word. You, didn't, you notice that Jesus is not mentioned. Does everybody get this? Because Jesus, who comes into this realm, comes with all of them. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these are one. And there are three that bear witness where? On the earth. In other words, a temporary reality. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are agree as one. Now, what connects the divine reality to the temporary reality? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's the one that brings reality to me and you, doesn't he? Amen. And if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He who believes in the son of God has a witness where? In himself. That treasure, eternal presence. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is where? In his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And when he answers us, what does it bring? It brings divine revelation, amen, which also will bring divine reality. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he better slap him. He will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin, not according to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. In other words, you need to do something about it. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, though. But the word says wages of sin is what? Death. So a sin that may, somebody may be committing at that point not be, might not be a matter of life and death. But if it continues, will it become a matter of life and death? Yes. 
Again, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. And that person is continuing to do this is love, has lost what? Divine reality. But he who has been born of God keeps himself. And what? And the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the world of, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and that we are in him who is true. And in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. I want to go to Proverbs 29 for a minute. Divine reality. In verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. Where there is no what? Revelation. Oh my goodness. Where there is no revelation, the lack of revelation or bring the lack of divine reality. Why? Because it says here, where there's no revelation, people cast off the restraints. A restraints of what? The flesh. But happy is he who keeps the law. Does everybody see this? Where there's no revelation. That's why you and I are to seek revelation. We're to seek it. We don't want anything to contaminate us. We don't want any place, make place with the devil. We want to stay clean. Why? Because we want constant contact all the time. Where the true reality of divine reality is constant with you. And I'm going to close at 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. And verse 18. First John chapter 2 and verse 18. Glory, divine reality. That's why people think you're very strange sometimes. Even my wife thinks that occasionally, but praise God. <laughs> In verse 18, little children, it is the what? Last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. It says that they went out from us, but they were not of, not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with, with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have a what? An anointing from the Holy One and you know what? All things. Why? Because you live from divine, you live out of divine reality. Knowing that temporary reality is temporary. Verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the what? The Christ, the eternal presence and power of truth of God Almighty. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son is the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, and you also abide in the Son and in the Father. Remember, abiding in the Son and the Father is called divine presence. Hmm. And this is the promise that he has promised us. What? Eternal life. Does the divine presence carry eternal life? Yes. Do you see how this is all connected? But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, 
And you don't need anyone to teach you. Why? Because we're taught by the anointing, not by humanoids. Picked. Never mind going there. And you don't need to go there. Oh, and you don't need anyone to teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie just as it is taught you, you will abide in him, the eternal presence. Wow. From divine reality. He wants to make it real to us. When we lose sight of its reality, his reality, and the divine reality, we drift. And then we begin to, begin to touch and agree with false reality, false hope, false deception, full deception, blown out deception. And then we open a door and contaminate ourselves. And then it gets harder to fight. Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Again, Lord, we ask that the seed that's been imparted in us become reality. We ask, Daddy, that you become so real to us as your sons and daughters, as your offsprings, as born of the Spirit and not of man's choice, but of your choice. We are here because you chose us, but we choose you now, Father. So, Lord, allow yourself to become a reality to us and that the divine reality of divine home, which we are now connected to, not only is just a hope, but is a reality of truth. So, Lord, release to your people an understanding of revelation, illumination, and reality with a new, fresh identity of who they are in you tonight. And I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen.